This video is brought to you by Wix. What's up guys, Jared again. Have you noticed the movies you watch getting more self-aware lately? From Deadpool snarking about production budgets. It's funny that I only ever see two of you. It's almost like the studio couldn't afford another X-Men. To Selena Gomez teaching us about stock shorting. So here's how a synthetic CDO works. To everything Quentin Tarantino touches, to every acting gig Bill Murray gets. Aren't you Bill Murray, man? That's Bill Murray? Yeah, I'm Bill Murray, but uh, let's keep that just between us, all right? We've seen a rapid influx of films that know their films and characters that know they're trapped behind a great big screen. All of which is to say that this thing we call meta, or specifically meta cinema, is very in. So much so that you might even find yourself getting sick of the whole shtick. Have we reached peak meta? Is this meta-ness truly new or something Hollywood has been doing for a hundred years? And is some modern meta just lazy? Let's find out. Welcome to this Wisecrack Edition on Meta Cinema. And not really any spoilers ahead, just general plot descriptions. But before we get into it, I wanna give a shout out to Wix. Wix is a website hosting platform you can build beautiful and professional looking websites. When we first partnered with Wix, we began to redesign our website and together we customized a unique destination that really lets our formats shine. We revamped our logos and made navigating a whole lot easier. The best part is it looks professional and honestly, makes Wisecrack look pretty dope. You can create your own website to promote your YouTube channel, podcast, or store. Wix has over 500 designer templates. You can make a site even if you have zero experience. They even have built-in mobile optimization, so no matter how people are finding you, they can search your website easily. We upgraded our site to one of Wix's premium plans so that we're able to host longer videos, get unlimited bandwidth, and so much more. So create your own unique website today by going to wix.com slash wisecrack and get 15% off all yearly plans plans by using the promo code WISECRACK15. And now, back to the show. Now, generally speaking, if a film seems to be winking at you about some aspect of its filminess, it's probably meta. On a basic level, this encompasses any film that is about filmmaking, film watching, or film analysis. It can also include films featuring characters talking directly to the camera, films with ironic third-person narration, no doubt Cheney fancied himself scot-free, and films with a certain brand of self-referential celebrity casting. Meta filmmaking is defined by film scholar Fernando Canet as a method whereby cinema looks at itself in the mirror in an effort to get to know itself better. In other words, it's self-reflexive. The only requirement is that it be born out of a process by which the filmmaker simultaneously creates a film and comments on the film they're creating, or the process of filmmaking, or the superficiality of the industry, or the gullibility of the cinematic audience, or, well, you get it. The condition of meta-ness can exist in a tweet that takes a dig at Twitter, a song that references its own songiness, and anything in between. And because it's so prevalent, a lot of people think meta-ness is simply a symptom of our hyper self-conscious age where people get married in Snapchat filters. But the truth is, artists have long been making meta art, for century after self-conscious century. Painters like Velazquez made huge paintings showing off their fancy art studios. Similarly, Shakespeare wrote plays with lines like, all the world's a stage, all the men merely players in which a character all but screams, Help! I'm trapped in a play! Please let me out! Similarly, authors have long written books with self-referential stylings, ranging from the 17th century classic Don Quixote to the modern classic The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If this all feels a bit vague and open-ended, it's because it kind of is, but rest assured we've spent an unhealthy amount of time thinking about metacinema so you don't have to. In the process, we've very unscientifically determined that every decade essentially gets the meta cinema it deserves, which is to say meta styles of cinema have changed and evolved through the ages. Keep in mind that like every generalization about media, our definitions cannot possibly encapsulate the wide range of gold and rot that a wide range of filmmakers create at any given time. What we can do is establish some guiding principles to explain the ways in which meta cinema has evolved from this to this to this. Whose balls did I have to fondle to get my very own movie? Let's get historical by starting in the early days of film, around the turn of the 20th century. This was a simpler time when actors were seen but not heard, often while making very silly faces. But just because the cinematic arts were underdeveloped at this point in time does not mean that filmmakers weren't already commenting on the somewhat limited art they were creating. Take 1901's Countryman and Cinematograph, 
a film about your hick uncle going to the movies. Or the following year's Uncle Josh at the Moving Picture Show, a film about your crazy hick uncle going to the movies and trying to fight with the characters on screen. What these and other films from the time have in common is that they commented on the film medium by focusing on the audience, and in doing so forced the audience to observe their own act of observing or spectate the pure novelty of their own cinematic spectatorship, which previously had simply not existed outside of live theater. While the biggest innovation of our era may be the perhaps not always welcome precision of CGI animation, the biggest innovation of this time was that commercial film existed at all, and that people were experiencing it firsthand in movie theaters. So it makes sense that this phenomenon was the substance behind metacinematics at the time. Filmmakers also showed quite a bit of concern with their new instrument, the camera, and how the camera made film different from theater or literature. The most famous meta output on this subject was the 1929 Russian film Man with a Movie Camera, in which the entire story is told self-consciously through the actual lens of the camera. By focusing entirely on the camera lens rather than story structure or character or any tools of yore, Man with a Movie Camera attempts to figure out what makes the genre unique and sublime. Present, too, were the humorously meta films that mostly drew from vaudeville traditions. Charlie Chaplin looked straight into the camera, while Groucho Marx directly addressed the audience. I've got to stay here, but there's no reason why you folks shouldn't go out into the lobby till this thing blows over. All this is to say that comedic traditions have long overlapped with meta references, because you have to have a sense of humor to make fun of the art you're doing while you're doing it. In the 1930s and 40s, we saw some meta musicals that were mostly about the magic and wonder of show business. They're not that interesting, so we're not going to belabor the point. Instead, let's move on to the more intriguing 1950s. To understand this decade, you need to know about one silent slapstick film from 1928 called Show People, which is remarkably prescient in the way it makes fun of the zaniness of Hollywood and celebrity fame, documenting the dramatic ascendance of a southern girl who becomes a snooty movie star. The film's legacy can be felt hard in the 50s. The 1950s was a very specific time in Hollywood. A few landmark antitrust court cases had started breaking up the mostly monopolized studio system, empowering many a subversive director who decided to, you guessed it, make meta-cinema. The 1950s thusly saw a proliferation of films about the strange, still newish industry surrounding movie making. These movies were, in their own big budget ways, slightly subversive in their skewering of the Hollywood models of fame that had come to dominate the industry. For example, Singing in the Rain depicts, among other things, a fake celebrity relationship staged exclusively for the benefit of paparazzi, while Sunset Boulevard depicts a starlet driven mad as her fame evaporates with age. Like an overly axe body sprayed soaked teenager, the industry had officially started winking and nodding at itself in the mirror. At the same time, these films represent what scholar Jane Foyer calls conservative reflexivity. That is, self-reflexiveness that still celebrates the overall status quo and valorizes the entertainment industry and the insanely talented people who constitute it. In this way, the 50s meta films were the perfect way station between old and new Hollywood. Now, if you've sat through at least one boring American history class, you probably have heard your fair share about how the 1960s revolutionized everything and the world was never the same because of loud boomers. But some of the most exciting films in film history were actually being made over in Europe, and especially France and Italy in the 1960s, as self-dubbed auteurs like Jean-Luc Godard and Federico Fellini had a field day rejecting the tropes of linear storytelling, predictable shot angles, and sensical editing. To them, meta-references were a means of boldly asserting their own uniqueness by mocking the standards created by big American studios. We saw these filmmakers bring back early cinematic devices like breaking the fourth wall, while also forging new traditions via jump cuts or non-sequential editing where you can literally feel the camera jump. In Ingmar Bergman's persona, during a tense moment between the film's two central characters, the film strip itself appears to be burning, and so realistically that some film projectionists actually went running to grab the nearest fire extinguisher. The effect makes it feel as if the actor's emotions set the actual emulsion on fire. These devices jolt us out of our conventional film watching experience, thereby causing us to question the filmmaking conventions that govern most movies. The biggest unifying factor of all these brands of metacinematic exploration is that they were all in earnest. For the most part, Godard wasn't trying to make you laugh, he was trying to make you think really hard. This creates something of a contrast to the 
1970s, which physically and psychically embodied cynicism. After the 1960s peace sign revolution failed to change anything and President Swetzelot bamboozled everybody, Metacinema reacted by delving headfirst into Parody City, which is a lot like Party City except with cheaper laughs. Walk this way. This way. Just kidding, parody is really fun, but man is it cynical about human nature. Parody had existed since the 1920s, with the most famous early parody being Charlie Chaplin's 1940 The Great Dictator, which was like a great big yo mama joke thrown at Hitler. In contrast, however, parody of the 1970s relied almost entirely on audience understanding of existing genre tropes that didn't fully exist in Chaplin's time. Movies like those of Mel Brooks, with their references to westerns, Frankenstein, Hitchcock, silent movies, and everything in between required pre-existing audience knowledge to understand. They were also more sophisticated, if still delightfully lowbrow jokes about the filmmaking process in general that required existing knowledge of how technical aspects such as sound effects worked. The famous horse hoof coconut joke from Monty Python is richest if you know that Foley artists regularly employ ridiculous humorous instruments to create their desired perfect sound. All in all, the 70s leaned in hard toward making fun of Hollywood conventions and relying on audiences to find them just as funny as the filmmakers themselves. <laughs> Fast forward to the late 80s and 90s, or the era when reality low-key died. Remember back in the day, a poor soul could only access news media at certain hours on certain days. That all ended with the birth of the 24-hour news cycle in the early 90s. The excessive access to local news about murders, floods, and skateboarding dogs inherently made reality something of a joke. Enter Mockumentary, the perfect medium to interrogate a time in which realness was starting to become relative. Christopher Guest films like Waiting for Guffman became defining cinematic moments of the time thanks to the way they skewered traditional interviews, subverted plots of traditional documentary, and above all, made the media look really, really dumb. Now, in the late 90s, we saw the beginning of a meta explosion that would continue basically unabated till present day. Many of these films continued trends from previous decades of meta-ness, whether they were films about the industry itself, such as Boogie Nights or Get Shorty, experimentally self-conscious works like Anything by Quentin Tarantino or David Lynch, or genre plays like Scream or Austin Powers. We also saw films like Being John Malkovich interrogate the celebrity industrial complex, and films like The Truman Show and Pleasantville explore the nature of how audiences separate, or don't separate, reality from television. Then, of course, there's the iconic 1999 South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, which features your favorite third graders heading to the theater to watch Terrence and Phillip Asses of Fire, a more obscene cinematic version of their favorite TV show, not unlike the audience who were functionally doing the same. Here, South Park uses Meta deliberately to deal with the media reception the show faced, namely complaints that it was too provocative and inappropriate for its young audience. Way back when, the advocacy group Parents Television Council criticized the show's over-the-top vulgar content, calling it a curdled, malodorous black hole of Comedy Central vomit that shouldn't have been made. On screen, similar moral hysteria ensues spearheaded by Kyle's mom. Here we see the show creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone self-reflexively mocking the media's vilification of their work, and thus interrogating South Park's place in the wider cultural landscape. While the South Park movie has meta qualities in a very literal and obvious manner, meta cinematics also manifested in more subtle ways during this era. Because so much was happening, we're gonna focus on what was really new. According to scholar Jordan Lavender Smith, it's worth looking to the digital revolution. Film changed dramatically, and this change is clear through the rise in meta film that re-explored the medium, as if from scratch, just as directors did in the earliest days of filmmaking. The way he sees it, the corresponding rise of so-called puzzle films that play with narrative structure, or frame the story itself as a device to be manipulated, is inherently the result of this switch, noting that the late 90s reframed the cinematic image as inherently manipulable, no longer a necessary index of physical reality. Puzzle films express that sense of lost reality by hiding or confusing important truths, inherently causing the audience to engage with new practices that fall outside the usual bounds of classic Hollywood narration. Take Christopher Nolan's 2000 film Memento, which tells its story backwards, making the audience acutely aware of the storytelling process at play. 
In films like these, narrative worlds are treated as reviewable, remixable, and upgradable, like the newly digitized world of Hollywood. Unsurprisingly, we saw an ensuing surge in puzzle films in the months and years that followed, with a particular emphasis on unreliable characters, vis-a-vis -vis American Psycho, A Beautiful Mind, Fight Club, Mulholland Drive, The Prestige, Shutter Island, The Usual Suspects, Vanilla Sky, and many, many more. Many of these films contain what Lavender Smith dubs a retrospective revision, or a montage sequence in which previous scenes from the film, like a digital film being constructed, are revisited, interpreted through a new lens of audience knowledge. What we're seeing here is a self-reflexive narrative story structure, a result of the new malleability of film in the digital age. We also saw meta implode in on itself with the introduction of increasingly layered examples of meta-ness. Screenwriter Charlie Kaufman blew things up with his 2002 work Adaptation, in which a desperate screenwriter writes himself into his own screenplay, only to find that screenplay literally take over his life. Then there's the mind-bending layered reality of Inception, which likens the structure of dreams to the structure of movies. In this new non-reality reality, there was no containing the myriad of ways directors could break our brains. All of which brings us to the 2010s, or a moment in which parts of meta-cinema and cinema became somewhat boringly married with kids in a two-car garage. It started cropping up in big-budget films, everything from 22 Jump Street. What if we actually went into the Secret Service and like tried to protect the White House? I think I'm saying I don't, we I don't think that would work. I'm gonna ask you to stop talking. I thought it was a pretty good idea. Do the same thing as last time. Everyone's happy. To Deadpool. Wasn't talking to you. I was talking to them. What we find that tends to unite these sorts of references is a skin deep quality. They're not trying to push buttons or change anything about the industry. They're merely referencing aspects of filmmaking because they know audiences are aware of them. There's also a quality of what I'll describe as, I know very well what I am doing is trite, but I nonetheless do it. Superhero landing. She gonna do a superhero landing. Wait for it. Woo! Superhero landing! Yeah, that's really hard on your knees. This is to say a Marvel film will often comment on the ridiculousness of its plot lines. The city is flying. We're fighting an army of robots. And I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. But indulge in it regardless. Here we see meta as just a joke. A funny joke, yes, but a joke without any real meaning, any appreciation of any earnest purpose or call to change. It's also interesting that meta-cinema has started appearing in the very films it used to make fun of. Meta-cinema, when done right, can be extremely subversive, questioning the form, function, and morality of filmmaking in general. However, once it becomes co-opted by mainstream blockbuster films, it starts to feel a bit toothless. A gag to make the audience laugh, but not to make them think. That's not to say there isn't some cool meta stuff going on. It seems like every year brings us a new meta classic. 2014's Birdman updated meta tales of fallen celebrity woes for the era of social media, while simultaneously engaging in perhaps the best ever meta casting of former superhero player Michael Keaton as a washed up former superhero. 2015's Inside Out represented human consciousness as a film watched by physical embodiments of our five major emotions. Last year's Sorry to Bother You gave us innovatively meta voiceover techniques that simultaneously called attention to both the film's own artifice and the artificial performance of race in America. Tim, I want to chop it up more, but I gotta get to my squash game. While Tarantino's latest hit, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is pretty much his most meta movie to date, exploring the very artifice of pulpy movie making as it simultaneously engages in it. We're also seeing the new possibilities of digital media creating space for new innovative forms of meta filmmaking. Take last year's Searching, which explores one man's search for his missing daughter as told entirely through his desperate digital quest to find her. It uses everything from FaceTime, to hidden cameras, to online message boards, to weave a narrative that never would have been possible even five years ago. Similarly, a film like last year's Unfriended Dark Web, which occurs entirely over video chat, makes you inherently aware of its filminess, but in a new, exciting way. Films like these explore the way new forms of digital media can offer different cinematic opportunities, mimicking all the convenience, annoyance, and just plain prosaic aspects of modern day technology. Meta, as you can see, is hardly a recent invention. Since the earliest days of filmmaking, and especially from the 1960s and on, filmmakers interrogated their craft through their craft. Some of these meta films have called for change, some have been philosophically profound, some have been commentary on our culture, and some have just been a big old joke, 
sometimes funny, and sometimes sucky. So where is meta going? We suspect that you're going to see more and more characters who know they're in movies, camera shots that make you aware you're watching a movie, and film editing that functions self-reflexively. This will be sometimes cool and sometimes will be kind of annoying. At the same time, the rapid proliferation of new forms of digital media and media making allows for infinite new possibilities for storytelling. But what do you think? Is Metaness inherently snobby? Is Marvel humor the right place for Meta to appear? And seriously, how do I get out of this box? Thanks to all our patrons who support the channel and our podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And before you go, I want to give another shout out to Wix. No matter what you're sharing, Wix is the best way to promote yourself or your brand. So create your own unique website today by going to wix.com wisecrack and get 15% off all yearly plans by using the promo code wisecrack15. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.